questions. If you're like typing questions as I'm talking, I can't unfortunately see it, but I will and shall try to get to it at the end. And in case I can't answer all those questions, um, we'll save it for the next session because this is actually a two-part series. It's really hard to talk about one subject solely um, because they're both interconnected. And so that is the gut, which we're gonna be talking about today. And then um, next session is gonna be on inflammation because they're very closely tied together. And I really can't do justice um, to both subjects um, in just one session. And even the two sessions, I know they both are two hours each um, and inshallah, I hope, I hope it flies by. Um, but even two sessions really isn't enough to kind of really get into the meat of the matter, but I'm gonna do my best. And um, my approach um, in these sessions is going to be research-based. So what does the literature tell us? What are we seeing in the studies? Who's doing the studies? That's also really important to look at because there is bias um, a lot of times. It just happens to happen um, as part of human nature um, that whoever's funding the studies, a lot of times we see positive results. Um, for example, um, let's suppose uh, one of the yo yogurt companies was you know, doing a probiotic um, study. It might be skewed in their favor because they have interest in the results, that makes sense. So, you know, we want to look at what the methodology is in the research, um, the sample size, how many people are they doing it on, you know, the, the study. Can we extrapolate when they're just pulling, you know, doing a study on three people and then extrapolate those results on the entire population? So it's, we kind of, you know, want to sort through all this um, and give the information that, you know, we're seeing. And with that said, this particular area of the microbiome is changing all the time. It is a very, very dynamic um, field. So even some of the stuff that I have in these slides, it probably is gonna get outdated you know, within a, a short amount of time. You know? But because again, as we're gonna be seeing, it's a universe. We have a universe in our body. And this universe, again, has so many different intricate parts to it. So you know, there's a constant um, new information that we're learning all the time. Um, with that said, I'm going to also acknowledge, you know, the allopathic realm, the functional realm, the holistic realm. I mean, all of those areas, you know, have great information. Um, but again, I'm coming at this purely from um, the research side. All right, let's go to my next slide. So Greek philosopher Hippocrates um, said this back in the day, and I'm sure our beloved Prophet also um, indicated as such. Um, that all disease begins in the gut. And I wish this was interactive because I think many of you are probably nodding and feeling like, yeah, this makes sense. Um, and somewhere along the lines, we kind of forgot about this. Um, but now this field, again, is rapidly emerging. Um, so much information coming out that is actually proving this point. So what is the gut microbiome? Right, what are we indicating? What are we referring to? So I wanna kind of put out some um, definitions um, before we kind of delve in deep um, on the subject matter here. So when I talk about the gut microbiome, I'm gonna be referring to microorganisms or microbes for short. And this encompasses bacteria, viruses, yeast, fungi, and other microscopic living things. And what's amazing is that we have trillions of these microbes within our intestinal tract, actually in our entire GI system, from the mouth to the rectum. We, it's lined with um, microbes. Um, also, we have microbes on our skin. And we even have microbes in our respiratory system. So it's amazing that we are literally crawling um, with these microbes. And out of all of these microbes, the most studied right now are the bacteria. But of course, you know, we're definitely digging into all the other microbes, especially right now with this pandemic, of course, the virus, um, the coronavirus. Um, but we're gonna be focusing a lot on, again, the, the bacteria. So this is a cute picture that one of my patients sent me and I just wanted to share it. This is our digestive system, everyone. This is what's going on. Um, so this is a cute little picture I wanted to show. But let's kind of talk about where the microbiome plays a role. 
So again, I'm trying to lay out the definitions here. I'm gonna have some background information before we go into this in, in greater detail. So the digestive system starts from our mouth. So actually digestion begins even before we eat, right? So we're getting ready for iftar, right? All the goodies that are uh, gonna be on our table. We start thinking about it, we start salivating, right? So the saliva has enzymes in there that is going to be helping to break down our food. Um, also in our mouth, um, we have bacteria, right? They help play a role in plaque formation as, many, as well as many other things. And there actually is very interestingly enough, a close tie-in between our oral health and even our cardiovascular health, um, interestingly enough. Anyway, so we start salivating, we take a bite of our samosa or whatever it is, um, we're chewing, right? And as we're chewing, you know, we have um, the mechanical action of digestion begin at that point by making food into smaller particles, saliva mixes in with the enzymes, and then we swallow and the food goes down our esophagus. And nothing really happens in the esophagus in terms of digestion, but it's just kind of pushing the food through. And um, within the esophagus, as in many different parts of the digestive system, um, there's an action called peristalsis. And I don't know if I should have my camera on or not. Um, but peristalsis, actually, I'm going to turn my camera on real quick. You guys, why not? Um, I don't know if you guys can see me. Can you guys see me? I can't see myself. Um, anyways, so there's an action like this, like a wave-like motion, and it's kind of pushing the food through. And this is going to be important later on when we talk about stress, because stress is actually going to affect that action of the peristalsis. So there's a wave-like contractions that's pushing the food through. The food hits our stomach, and our stomach is an acid bath. So the pH values of our stomach is very, very low, so that food is broken down further there into smaller particles. Now it's like this frothy substance called chyme. Don't worry, guys, there's not a quiz, um, but just giving you this information. So it's like a frothy substance. Digestive enzymes are there as well. Hydrochloric acid um, is, again, breaking down the food into smaller particles. And then at this point, the food slowly gets squirted in to the small intestine. So the food doesn't just like gush through. So there's actually a little sphincter of valve between the stomach and the small intestine and food is kind of squirted in a little bit at a time. And the small intestine, this is an extremely large portion of the GI tract. Um, the whole GI tract actually um, is about the size of half of a tennis court. So it's amazing, coiled into our body and a majority of that actually is our small intestine. So our small intestine, this is where a majority of absorption of nutrients occur. And the small intestine itself is broken into three parts, the duodenum, the ileum, the jejunum. And in each part of the small intestine, certain nutrients are absorbed. So at a certain portion, calcium is absorbed. At a certain portion, magnesium, carbohydrate, um, glucose, and fats are broken down and reassembled. And the small intestine, the lining of the small intestine has a brush-like border. So it's kind of like little fingers called um, villi, microvilli, oh, sorry, villi. And then the fingers have fingers. So the villi have microvilli. And this increases the surface area. So when I, I really like analogies and visuals a lot. So when I think of the small intestine, I think of like a car wash. So the food's cruising through, right? Things are being squirted in, bile and other um, digestive enzymes right? Then it's got this brush border that, you know, food is being absorbed through. So then after the small intestine, the food enters the large intestine. And the large intestine, this is where a lot of those undigested particles now are going to transverse through. Um, water is going to be absorbed at this um, point in time because as the body is going to impact and um, get ready to make stool, right? So as the food is going through the large intestine, this is where the majority of the gut microbiome is. It's actually in the large intestine. So they're involved with quote unquote, like backup digestion. So whatever wasn't properly digested in the body, now they're going to take care of. There's also toxins in our food, right? Um, so the toxins are also going to be taken care of by this microbiome. Um, so this is kind of where they are lying in the large intestine. 
So then water is absorbed um, and then um, matter gets compacted into um, the rectum area as stool and then gets later on excreted. So the gut, so the GI um, intestinal tract, the gastrointestinal tract starts with the mouth and ends with the anus. And this is actually the largest surface area of interaction between the internal environment of the body and the outside world. So think about it. Everything that we're eating and drinking, right, is going to be transversing through this entire system, which is literally about the size of half of a tennis court. So there's a lot of things that could potentially go wrong here, right? Because if we ate something wrong, let's suppose we had a burger and it had E. coli in it, God forbid, right? Um, so this is a, a toxic bacteria, right? So now our gut, it's transversing through their gut, right? And our body has to contend with this. So the gut really has two essential functions. So it's like a filter. So it's basically regulating absorption of nutrients. Um, and then it's also considered to be a barrier. So it's going to help prevent harmful organisms and substances from getting into our circulation. We don't want E. coli in our bloodstream. Then it's going to get into the rest of our body and it can literally shut down our body and can cause death um, as an example. So this is really a very vital, important function that the gut is um, doing that a lot of times we don't think about. Now, I know some of you are thinking, why are we talking about all the science part of this? Why can't you just tell us what to eat? <laughs> and that's a common question that a lot of my patients ask me. Because for me, honestly, I like to explain the science kind of of what's going on so that when we are making our food choices, our lifestyle choices, that we are aware of how this is impacting our body. Yeah, if I eat this donut, yeah, it tastes amazing for like 30 seconds. But what is going to happen once it gets into my um, digestive tract, right? So all of this stuff is important, you know, so that's why I kind of like to put the foundation down, but don't worry, we will be talking about what we should be eating and all that good stuff. But right now, I just want to kind of want to set the stage here. Now, this slide that I'm showing right now is going to come up again a little bit later. Um, so our intestinal cells, if, if, um, sorry, let me go back there, guys. I'm trying to see if I have a little pointer here. Do I have a pointer? I don't know. But on the left side of our screen here, you see the intestinal cells. So they're very closely packed in together. There's no gap, all right? So as the food's going through, you know, you see the little finger-like projections on the top. They're kind of swaying, right? And again, at certain junctions, certain food is going to be, nutrients are going to go through, right? So the mucosal cells, they're regulating what is getting through. And there actually is mucus lining this area. And I know a lot of times when we think of mucus, we're like, oh, gross, you know, but mucus actually has a vital role because the mucus itself is lined with the, a lot of the immune cells. And next session, when we talk about immunity, I'm going to go into depth about the immune system. But just for right now, think of the immune system like a military in our body. They literally have different jobs that they're doing. They're scouting our body, right? Like right now, with this pandemic in place, right? They were going to be scouting the body for this potential virus. I mean, God forbid any of us gets it or anything. Um, so the immune system is, again, the military in our body, regulating. And they are closely intertwined with the mucosal cells and the immune system and our gut microbiome, as we're going to talk about a little bit later, they talk to each other. They literally are sending signals to each other. So for example, if something weird is coming through and through our GI system, the gut microbiome will alert the immune system. There's something weird here. There's salmonella coming in. Wow, there's E. coli here. You guys better remember what this looks like because God forbid if this comes again next time, take care of it, right? So the gut microbiome is actually training the immune cells. It's amazing. This is why I kind of geek out at this part. <laughs> so anyways, so as the food portions are going through, they get absorbed through the mucosal intestinal cells and they get into the bloodstream and they go to where they're needed. Now, what unfortunately can happen due to our lifestyle, what we're eating, stress, so many other factors, toxins, um, endocrine disruptors, what can start to happen is we can start to see gaps 
occur between the cells. I don't know if you guys can see, I don't know, is my cursor there? Anyways, so if we start seeing gaps between these cells, now they can't regulate those toxic things. So now random stuff can literally go through those gaps, get into the bloodstream and hit our body, go to our brain, go to our liver, to our kidneys, to our heart, right? So this is where this is very, very concerning. We don't want these gaps, right? We want to make sure that there's these tight junctions. And again, we're going to talk more about how this, um, these gaps might happen. Now, this is called leaky gut. There's a lot of controversy um, surrounding the leaky gut um, syndrome. Some people are for it. Some people are not. You know, um, I personally am all about it. Um, but, you know, the research still has to be definitive on, on this um, particular phenomenon. Um, but interestingly enough, our gut microbiome plays a very key role here. Now, also allow me to geek out a little bit here. But our gut microbiome, think about this, guys. I want you to close your eyes and think about this. We have 10 times more microbial cells than human cells. All right. So we have 10 times more microbial cells than human cells. Does that mean we're more microbe? No. But <laughs> this kind of just makes this, it just is mind blowing when you think about it, that these cells are all around us. And we have approximately 100 trillion microorganism cells that live in our GI tract, 100 trillion, that's like national debt numbers, right? That are living mostly in our large intestine, but they're all over our GI tract, right? Starting from our mouth. And the large intestine is home to around 1,000 different species, give or take. Now, you know, no one's counted this out yet, but this is what research is looking at. What are the species? What are the different genuses, the subgenuses? What are these guys doing? So as you can see, you guys, there's a universe. And these microbes may weigh as much as two to three pounds, so roughly about the size of the weight of our brain. Now, I always, tell my, I always tease my patients when they step on the scale. I'm like, no, you cannot subtract two to three pounds and pretend that's just your microbes. I mean, they are, but it's still part of us right? But think about it. Two to three pounds are our microbes. And these microbes together are functioning as an extra organ in the body, and they're playing a huge role in health. They're actually keeping our body's operations running smoothly. And what's important to note, everyone, is they're regulated mostly by our diet, but they also talk to each other. They get signals from us. Like right now, we're in a state for many people of high anxiety with everything going on. So those are the anxiety is providing signals to these different um, uh, microbes, to the different cells in our body. And this can impact our overall health. So this is some of the many, many functions of the gut microbes. So they're very key actually in helping us extract different nutrients. So they actually help us manufacture B vitamins. So B vitamins, you guys, are really, really important with metabolism of energy. So a lot of times you hear people, oh, I'm feeling tired. I think I need B vitamins. Not, yes, you do. It's not the vitamin itself, but the vitamins itself are helping us to extract energy and metabolize energy from the nutrients that we're consuming. So, um, the gut microbiome is very closely intertwined with this. Also, the gut microbiome helps us to manufacture vitamin K, which is very important in blood clotting with also bone health. The microbes also help us to ferment fiber. We're going to be talking about fiber later on, but they help us ferment fiber. And fiber is not broken down by our body. That's the beauty of fiber. It helps us you know, uh, keep regular, helps us uh, decrease risk of... Uh, colon cancer, decreases risk of constipation, helps us decrease our blood sugars, cholesterol values. There's so many things fiber can do. So fiber is relatively undigested. And as it gets into our large intestine, then these microbes help to ferment them into something called short chain fatty acids. This helps for healing the colon wall. The microbes help us to transform phytochemicals. Phytochemicals and antioxidants are very important key um, components that we find in fruits, vegetables, whole grains. This can actually help us combat diseases, cancer, coronavirus, 
Um, so the microbes will help us to transform these phytochemicals to make them more bioavailable. And it helps us to enhance mineral absorption, magnesium, calcium, to name a few, potassium, which are very key electrolytes in our body um, for heart health, for bone health, everything. The gut microbes, this next part's very interesting. They can actually help modulate our appetite and food intake. Now, this is a huge, huge area that researchers are looking at. Is there some sort of a microbe that we potentially could have in our body that's like an energy saving microbe? You know what I mean? So, like, for example, does this microbe or microbes, can they hold on to some of the calories that we're eating? Is that why some people can lose weight easily and some people can't? Right? We see this in families, siblings. How come my sibling can eat whatever they want? And they're like skinny. And here I am. I just look at food and I like puff up, right? So could this be potentially due to the microbes? This is a huge area because can you imagine if we found the microbe? We found it, everyone. We found the microbe that causes obesity. Now, everyone, you know, we're going to give you supplements of this microbe and everyone's going to be skinny, right? That is like the million dollar, billion dollar um, question that researchers are looking at. Right? Is it, but is it that simple? We don't know. In any case, but we do know, interestingly enough, because there's a lot of research going on with fecal transplants. So yes, this is a real thing. They take the feces of someone, they purify it, and then they inject it into the micro, as a gut, excuse me, of another individual. And actually, we're finding, for example, in people that have inflammatory bowel diseases, we've actually found. Um, an alleviation of symptoms, right? They've done the studies on mice. They've, they actually can raise germ-free mice. It's a very interesting concept. But they've taken these germ-free mice and they'll take, again, the fecal um, transplant material of like, let's suppose an obese other mouse, input it into this germ-free mouse and guess what happens to that mouse? It gets obese, right? So this is really showing us that again, the microbes play a huge role more than we could potentially um, imagine here. So anyways, um, also these microbes can help us regulate metabolism. Again, how we're extracting energy, right? Is this different between people? Yes, potentially. Also, our microbes are defending us, the host, against pathogens. It helps us um, protect us against bad bacteria, bad viruses, so forth. Helps boost the integrity and strength of the gut barrier. We don't want the junction of the uh, mucosal cells to have gaps. So having good microbes helps that. And it actually induces a development, training, and function of our immune system. So our immune system is trained by the gut microbes. So 70 to 90% of our immune system is based in the gut, 70 to 90%. So if our gut's off, you guys, we are off. And I know, again, a lot of you probably are nodding your head, right? That if you're having tummy issues, you're just not feeling good, right? So this is why it's very important in this pandemic era. Everyone's you know, concerned about you know, sheltering in place, which, I'm, which we definitely should be doing, and, and all those measures that we're taking. But we all should be, should be taking measures on what we're eating. What's our overall diet? What's our overall lifestyle, right? This is key because, again, 70 to 90% of the immune system is in our gut. And it's actually believed to help us and prevent allergies, can help decrease and downregulate inflammation, right? The microbes are actually um, referred to as our body's second brain. It's amazing because in our gut, you guys, we have neurons. And the only other place in our body that we have neurons is our brain. So there's like 100 million neurons, give or take, that are transmitting nerve impulses in our gut. And this next part's mind blowing too. Um, the gut bacteria can produce the neurotransmitters dopamine, serotonin, and GABA. How many of you have heard of these things? Right? I think many people know of dopamine and serotonin. Um, but these are actually the feel-good mood neurotransmitters. 95% of serotonin is made and found in the gut. So there is actually a very close association, research is looking at this right now, between anxiety and depression and the gut microbiome. 
because it's kind of like the chicken and the egg thing right now. Because for instance, let's suppose someone has anxiety or depression. They're not feeling well. Like, are they going to feel well to get up and make a healthy meal? Are they going to have that energy, that stamina to be like, hey, I'm going to go for a walk, right? Probably not. And in that case, they're not eating good food. They're not getting those nutrients that the body needs. So as a result, right, they're probably going to feel worse. Their, their, their microbiome is going to be more towards a non-beneficial type, right? Um, on the other side of the coin, you know, could the depression and anxiety cause a dysbiosis of the microbiome potentially? So we don't know which, which way it goes. But regardless, when a person's feeling like that, that's when they should be getting good food. I always tell my patients, I'm like, you know, when you guys have those good days when you're feeling amazing, you know, make yourself some soup, make some good food and freeze it so that when you have, you know, God forbid those days where you're just like off and eh, I'm just going to eat that week old burrito sitting, you know, in the fridge, at least then you have some good nourishing food that you can turn to that can help you fight off some of this. So this is a huge area that's being looked at. Um, because again, you know, researchers want to know, is there a particular microbe that we can just give people that it's going to make them, you know, not feel anxious and depressed? You know, we don't know yet. Um, so overall, our gut microbiome also, as we're learning, could potentially affect um, disease states like cancer, metabolic syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and there could be more. So. As I mentioned before, our gut and the immune system work together. So 90% of the bacteria in our body is good, but 10% or more could be bad. So this creates a dysbiosis, an imbalance in our micro population. And so it's kind of like a stock portfolio. We want our stock portfolio to be diverse. We don't want to just put all of our money into, I don't know, Tesla or whatever. We want to have like a diverse um, portfolio. Same with our gut microbiome. We want to have diversity. And because when there is an imbalance, this could potentially be associated with diseases, inflammatory bowel disease, IBS. IBS is on the rise. We see this a lot in women, a lot, irritable bowel syndrome. There actually is a close tie in actually um, between emotions actually with IBS and of course um, the microbiome. Also, this dysbiosis can drive inflammation. And I'm going to talk about, again, inflammation next session because it's just so, that's a whole beast in itself. And this pathogenic bacteria that we could potentially have in our body may cause, di um, sorry, anxiety, may cause mood disorders. It could increase sensitivity to pain. It can actually affect our cognitive function and could be more. Now, stress. Again, this is another beast in and of itself. So stress, everyone, definitely alters our gut function. And interestingly enough, you guys, we have something called a vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is a nerve that runs from our large intestine, our gut, our GI tract, to our brain. So this is where we sometimes get that term, right? Butterflies in my stomach, right? You're stressed out, right? Again, right now we're living in stressful times. Um, you know, you're stressed things are going on. And then all of a sudden, wow, I'm having, you know, loose bowel movements. Wow. I'm feeling constipated. It can work both ways. So there actually is a close tie in between how our, you know, our brain and our gut through again, the vagus nerve. So stress can actually affect that peristalsis. That's that wave-like muscle contractions that's pushing food through our body. So when we're stressed, you guys, remember this. Our body goes into preservation mode, right? We got to preserve life because something's wrong. So I got to hold on to these calories. I'm going to slow down how I'm digesting because I don't have time for that. So that's why as a result of stress, you guys, a lot of times we do see higher incidence of weight gain, right? Or weight becomes difficult to take off. That weight a lot of times is in our abdominal region because our body's like, I'm going to hold on to the weight, the calories for dear life. I'm going to close it, uh, hold on to it close, right? So stress really wreaks havoc on our body. So we're not digesting properly. It's affecting the peristalsis. We're hypersensitive to gut activity. So people could be getting diarrhea or on the flip side, constipation. 
this corticotropin releasing factor that's um, released can delay gastric emptying, right? Or it can increase the activity of the colon. And it could potentially, the stress could potentially cause leaky gut. So that's what I was talking about earlier. The, ju the, the junctions between the mucosal cells can get wide and create this space. So here are some of the things that potentially could cause a leaky, leaky gut syndrome. Some certain dietary proteins, um, antibiotics, um, infections, having blood sugar issues, stress, food allergies, toxins, even menopause. Pregnancy can alter the, the function, um, antibodies, and so forth. So again, I'm going to talk about this next week, but just a little heads up on what inflammation can do. And inflammation that's caused by stress and other factors in the body can cause a lot of different diseases. Now, for this gut bacteria, I know some of you are thinking, oh my gosh, this is so overwhelming. Um, again, I'm just kind of giving you the science background of how important they are and how we really have to take care of our gut, right? But the gut bacteria, you know, research shows it can change pretty quick, right? And it can change with age. This is why for many of us, we can't eat some of those things that we used to, right? I was thinking about what I used to eat in college. I'm like, now, no way, right? I would be super sensitive to some of that food. So with age, our gut bacteria does evolve. In pregnancy, it changes as well. With stress and anxiety, we see more or less friendly, more bad bacteria. What we eat is directly affecting our gut bacteria, directly. And there's this really cute video I really wanted to show earlier on, but it wasn't working, and I just kind of gave up uh, um, after a quick attempt. But if you guys go to YouTube and you just type in Ted Ed Gut, there's this really super cute, it's my favorite um, YouTube video, it's like a five-minute cartoony video about, again, what the gut microbiome does, but it's really cute. But it talks about in there a study where they actually had people eat a vegetarian, more of a vegetarian a diet versus more of like a, you know, animal-based, animal protein diet. And there was definitely a distinction. We'll talk more about that later. 60% of approximately 200 strains remain constant for five years. Again, I don't know who exactly counted that, but, you know, a rough estimate. And this is amazing, you guys. No two people are the same. You can live in the same house with people eating the same stuff, and yet still, your gut microbiota is totally different. It's actually more of an accurate identifier of us than our own DNA. So no two people are the same. Now, how does it all start? So the gut microbiome actually begins to affect us the moment we're born. And actually some research is showing there's some new evidence um, emerging that shows that babies actually may come in contact with microbes while inside the womb, right? Via the placenta from the mom, what the mom's eating, right? Mom's stress levels really affect the baby as well, interestingly enough. Now, but majority of the... Uh, I guess you can say gut infiltration, uh, microbe infiltration in the uh, human begins actually more so as the baby is being born. So as the baby is transversing through the vaginal canal, right? Its mouth is open, crying, whatever, right? So it's, it's actually taking in those different secretions, right? Which are full of microbes. So this is now, right? going to go into the baby's um, microbiome, or sorry, the gut, and now create their microbiome. And the higher the microbiome diversity, microbiome diversity, the better for one's health. And there actually is a distinction. We've seen a difference between babies born um, naturally versus C-section baby. We actually have seen a difference in their gut microbiome. The C-section babies, unfortunately, don't have as diverse of a microbiome. Also, when a mom's in nursing, it ha helps to build more of a diverse microbiome. And there's things now happening in place with um, moms that have to have a C-section to try to incorporate more of a diverse microbiome for the baby. Um, but that is something interesting that we um, have seen. Now, in history, in our food history, everyone, we used to actually be very closely in contact with the natural world, right? People used to eat fresh from the garden, 
right? People used to drink from wells and streams. I am not recommending drinking from wells and streams, but I'm just saying people used to do that, right? Live bacteria and other microorganisms were eaten in food and they were used to preserve food, <coughs> right? We didn't have proper refrigeration, right? So foods were fermented, they were salted, they were cured, right? We ate more natural, right? Now with refrigeration, sterilization, pasteurization, chlorination, and other processing, we have way less exposure to microbes, right? And, you know, granted, I'm not saying that, you know, we should just be eating non-pasteurized food, go out, get a cow, milk it, and just drink that. Because our guts, we're not ready. We can't. We can't handle that. We will get sick, right? And it's interesting, you know, we, we notice this sometimes when we travel, right? Um, if you have you know, family members that live in other countries, right? Like they can handle a lot of foods. And when we travel, we're like, oh, I can't eat some of that, right? Because our American microbiome just can't cut it sometimes, right? Because of, again, the way that um, the diversity of our microbiome. So it definitely is a difference that we're seeing, right? And even more so now with all this hypersensitive, um, you know, sanitation that we're in undertaking, is this affecting our gut microbiome? Probably, right? So this is, you know, we're, we're in the midst of a huge experiment right now, what's going on with this pandemic. So more on that later. Um, so we don't consume, you know, as many fermented foods. We're not as closely tied to nature as we were before. Constant hand washing, right? Again, there's good and bad of, of both here. And this is, a, I got to always tell a funny story at this part here. Um, but one of my relatives, I remember when, when her daughter was an infant, you know, she's crawling around, you know, putting everything in her mouth as babies do. But she was telling me once that she had turned and she saw her daughter straight up lick the bottom of a shoe. Okay. I know. She licked the bottom of a shoe. So my relative's like freaking out. She's like, should I wash her mouth out with soap? What should I do? Obviously she didn't. But she was telling me, she's like, that flu season, that child did not get sick once, right? Because she had exposure to all these micro right, microbes. Disclaimer, do not lick shoes. Okay, I'm not saying to lick shoes, guys. Please don't take, that, take this away from this session. But I'm just saying, you know, that, you know, when we have a diverse amount of microbes that we're exposed to, it actually helps with our overall immunity. So these are real life pictures of bacteria. No, just kidding, they're not. <laughs> These cartoons I found. But here are some examples of good versus bad gut bacteria. There's a lot more. But the major classes of good bacteria that we find in our gut is actually the lactobacillus um, species and the bifidobacterium species. So these guys are good. And even amongst them, there's different classes. There's lactobacillus acidophilus, acidophilus, which many of us, if we read the back of yogurt, you will see that in there. Um, Bifidobacterium longum, like there's so many subclasses of these, but these two classes are, you know, across the board, good for us. Saccharomyces boulardii, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, this, these are yeast. So even yeast can be beneficial, right? Although an overgrowth of yeast is not a good thing, but, you know, some yeast can be beneficial. Saccharomyces boulardii actually is one of the organisms that is in one of the um, probiotics called Florastor. And that actually has been shown to help with antibiotic-related diarrhea. So this is where a lot of research is going to look at. What do these guys do? Lactobacillus, does it help with our skin health? Because we even have, you know, skin, you know, microbes on our skin, right? And there's a lot of, you know, probiotic, you know, moisturizers and, thumb, and things kind of hitting the market as well. So that's kind of where research is looking at. What do these different microbes do? And what do they do together? What if a particular strain of lactobacillus gets with a particular strain of bifidobacterium? What happens? So this is where we really need to know more. Can we get too much of a good thing? Can they, how do they interact with each other? What's going on? So this is where we have to be careful. Is there something, is there, is there something of being too much of a good thing? Yes. Now, we also have bad bacteria, and there's a lot of bacteria, viruses, and stuff. But these are just some of the, the big ones that we've seen. Salmonella, which is very prevalent in um, poultry. So that's why we want to make sure we always cook poultry properly. It can even be in eggs. 
um, Shigella, E. coli. E. coli, interestingly enough, what's really fascinating, you guys, is not only is our gut microbiome changing, but so are animals' gut microbiomes. So think about cows. What should cows be eating? Grass, right? But what are cows eating now? What are they being forced to eat, poor guys? They're being forced to eat each other. Um, unfortunately, and I'm being kind of um, sarcastic there, but unfortunately, we've seen that in the feed that they're feeding some of these animals could be even remnants of other animals, right? They're eating grain to fatten them up real quick to get them out into the marketplace. Think of how much meat consumption the world is eating, right? A lot. So what's, what they're finding is this, all this grain consumption and what you know, cattle is eating is changing their microbiome. So we're actually seeing high amounts of E. coli in their guts. So again, if there's not proper you know, sanitation and so on and so forth going on in some of these places, the E. coli can actually get into our food, right? via the meat itself. But unfortunately, what we're seeing more so is the runoff of these factory farms have some of these different bacteria and toxins, and they will infect, you know, uh, some of the produce. That's what we see, you know, every so often outbreaks in, you know, spinach, cilantro, or, you know, other greens and vegetables. It's not the vegetable's fault, right? It's all that runoff from these factory farms. So, any case, so even the poor animals, their microbiome is different and it's affecting us. And the way that these animals are living, right? High stress situations, right? They're boxed in together with each other. The animals being slaughtered, they see it, they hear it. In our tradition, that's not how it's supposed to be, right? The animals are supposed to be treated well. They're not supposed to see or hear another animal being slaughtered. Animals know that they are meant to be food for the believers. They know that, but they do not need to be subjected to the atmosphere that they're in. So think about the stress levels of these animals. They get slaughtered and the stress, right? All those stress hormones are circulating and now that's in the meat. Is that affecting our stress levels, right? That's food for thought. Anyways, going back, I'm off the soapbox. I'm <laughs> going back to the bad bacteria. Campylobacter bacteria, this a lot of times we see in cold cuts. And in C. diff, Clostridium difficile. We see this a lot, unfortunately, in nursing homes sometimes can get high amounts of people that have C. diff. I remember hearing a story of a lady, an elderly lady, and she was, you know, forgetting things and just you know, showing some of the signs of dementia. And her family's like, well, this is just what happens in old age. No, it actually turned out she had high levels of C. diff that was affecting her cognitive function. So a simple fix for that, and what I know a lot of nursing homes are doing, is they give their constituents yogurt, and they've seen a dramatic decrease in C. diff cases as well as other bacterial infection cases. So something just as simple as yogurt, which is chock full of probiotics. Now, in our tradition, it's amazing how many times over and over and over and over in the Quran, in the Hadith, we are implored to eat that which is lawful, good, pure thing, over and over and over. And it's beyond just, okay, I'm eating halal. I'm just eating zabiha. It's beyond that. I just talked about earlier, right, how animals are being treated, right? How that's, that's not what we should be eating. We shouldn't be eating those type of animals, right? We want to eat animals that are in good conditions, right? So it's really beyond halal and zabiha. It's the quality of the food. Yeah, I know your French fries are halal, good. But is that good for you? What's the quality of that food? So that's what we have to look at, everyone, is the quality of what we're eating. I get it, you guys, right? Some of this food tastes good, right? Put French fries in front of me. I can never say no, right? But we have to look at the big picture. How much am I eating of these foods? What types of foods am I eating? How often am I eating? Right? We're, for those that are fasting right now, we're in the midst of a beautiful month. It really teaches us, you know, self-restraint, right? Um, so I'll talk a little bit later about fasting and all the benefits of fasting on the body. There's so many, so many, so many. Um, 
but we're not meant to be eating all the time, you guys. We're not meant to be eating every two hours. I know there was a lot of different diets out in the past that where people, you know, are eating every two hours. I remember once I had gone to this um, <coughs> seminar. It was actually a seminar to get trained to be a personal trainer. Uh, it's very fascinating because there's this gentleman in front of me and this seminar was the whole day. And I'm not kidding you guys, every two hours on the dot, he had um, a huge like um, lunch bag next to him. And every two hours he would pull out a, a, tup a Tupperware, you know, of his carrots and his hummus or some sandwich. So every two hours he's eating. And I'm just like watching this from behind. I'm like, wow, so regimented, mashallah. Anyways, the seminar ends, we get up to leave and I turn and he turns and he has this big like pot belly situation going on. And I was like, you know what? All this constant eating is not what the body is meant to do. We're not meant to be eating so often. Right? We should be spacing out our meals, right? Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Some people don't even need breakfast. They can go out you know, without breakfast, fine. But we really need to be looking at the quality of what we're eating because we are what we eat. And we'll talk about this more in the next session when we talk about um, inflammation. But there are nutrients, food nutrients talk to our body. They talk to our genes. Right? This is a huge field that's being looked at. It's amazing. So I just want to kind of remind us, you guys, that we really have to focus on pure, good things, non-processed things. Now, I'm not saying don't eat fun stuff. You know, I'm all about the fun stuff. But maybe like once a day, okay? I'm going to have that iftar time. I'm really going to you know, want a small piece of you know, cake that my daughter made. Okay, go ahead. Enjoy. Right? Have a small amount. But what are you mostly doing? That's what's important. And nutrition, you guys, is really individualized. It's really hard to say one size fits all. Everyone do the same thing. You know, I get this a lot from people. I can't tell you how many times people text me. Can you just tell me what to eat? Can you just give me a plan? Just give me a menu. And I'm like, all right, let's first see what you're eating. What do you eat? That's how we work. What are you used to eating? What works for your body? right? That's the key. So that's how I always work. And I want to hear from people. What are you eating? Let's work with where you're at. There is no one size fits all, right? Oatmeal, for example, oatmeal is a very good breakfast and it's actually really good food to eat at Sahur time, right? Um, the steel cut oats, the old fashioned oats, not the instant. Try to stay away from the instant because that's really processed up. But you know, you make your own oats, you can make it in the crock pot, you can do over overnight oats, you know, put some milk in there, cow's milk, you know, whatever other non-dairy milk that you want, you know, um, nuts, fruits, you know, chia seeds, flax seeds, go all out. That's an excellent food, right? But I know for me personally, I love oatmeal, by, by the way, but when I eat oatmeal, it just doesn't, like, I'm not feeling as full as I could with other foods because it just doesn't work for my body. Right? So that's something that we need to keep track of because even good foods sometimes may not work for us. For example, I have a friend. She was telling me, she's like, every time I eat broccoli, I'm just all bloated and messed up. I'm like, okay, then don't eat broccoli. There's so many other vegetables you can eat. That's just not working for your body right now. And it's okay. So we can't know what we need to change until we keep track. So this is what I really suggest doing, everyone. You can do this right now in Ramadan. You can do it after Ramadan. But get um, a food journal, a calendar. I like those big calendars that I can actually look at the whole month and keep track. Oh, today I'm just so tired. Oh, my gosh. It's just like I just couldn't move. All right, write that down in your calendar. Tired. And then try to remember what you ate that day, right, and jot it down. Oh, my gosh, today I was so bloated, right? Okay, write that down. Today, I was feeling so anxious. I don't know what was going on, right? Jot it down. Put it in your calendar, how you're feeling, and then try to remember what you ate. Because food, stress levels, sleep is another thing, all can affect that outcome, right? So write down, yeah, I was feeling so tired. Yeah, I didn't sleep well. Okay, so it's probably because of sleep. But it could also be because of maybe what you're eating, right? We could have a lot of food sensitivities right? There are practitioners out there, you know, mashallah, out there, functional practitioners that can actually do food sensitivity tests, you know, and, you know, the test can work in different ways. I remember one of my friends, um, I actually did do a food sensitivity test. and It was very fascinating because she gave me the results of the test. She's like, you're sensitive to eggs. And I was like, what? Eggs? 
because I used to at that time eat one egg every day. And I was like, oh my gosh, what? She's like, yeah, I wouldn't advise you to eat so much eggs because you're super sensitive. So I don't know if I was super sensitive because it was in my system or if I really was. Um, but what was very interesting is when I reduced the egg, I kind of, you know, negotiated with her. I got down to like, I'm like, can I just have one egg a week? So I noticed that when I cut out the egg at that time, I felt more energy. So I was like, this is so interesting because sensitivities don't manifest sometimes as eczema or, you know, hives or anything like that. They can manifest in simple things like, yeah, being fatigued. And what was really interesting also is when I got a blood test done that year, again, I didn't change anything else in my diet. The only thing I changed was reducing the eggs and my cholesterol values dropped big time. So I know for me in my body, I am sensitive to that. And not everyone is, right? For, for others of you, you might be cool with having that one egg a day and not have, not have any problems. So this is where we have to remember it's very individualized. And the reason it's so individualized, everyone, is because of our gut microbiome. All of our microbiomes are different. So again, jot down what you're eating, how you're feeling. Let's try to find some sort of a common denominator, right? I'm always willing to help people out, but I need you to do the homework first. So for those that know me or don't know me, you know, I can share my information later. You're welcome to message me. I'd be more than happy to help you out to try to get some of this stuff sorted out. Um, also, you know, stress plays a role too. So you might notice, wow, every, you know, second Wednesday of the month, I'm so, I'm having cravings. That's another thing to keep track of is cravings. I forgot to mention that. So tired, bloated, anxious cravings. So Oh, every third, you know, Wednesday of the month, I'm having so many cravings. And you might realize that that might be the day that you have a, an audit at work, right? Because stress can drive cravings. So these are interesting things that we need to know. So we know what works for us. So, and then, you know, on the flip side, there might be a meal that you eat that you're like, wow, this was amazing. I feel so good. I feel satiated. I feel energized. Write down what that meal is because that works for your body. And I can guarantee you that meal is not shake, fries, and burger. So that's never going to make you feel good for a long period of time, okay? But, you know, the good foods and non-processed wholesome foods. So really keep track, you guys, is my biggest recommendation. Now, let's talk about probiotics. Now, according to the World Health Organization, probiotics are live microorganisms which when administered in adequate amounts, confer a health benefit on the host. So this definition is very, I don't know how to say it, broad-based, right? Because how do I know what an adequate amount is? How am I measuring a health benefit, right? What is a live organism? Which ones are we talking about, right? So there's so many ifs and, and you know, ands to this. But that's like the general um, definition. So in this case, what I'm going to kind of pull from this is basically live microorganisms that are beneficial to our body. Microorganisms that actually help encourage a healthy microbiome, right? So that our body is functioning at its optimum. What's interesting about a lot of these probiotics that we consume is a lot of them are kind of just like travelers, right? They kind of pass through. They don't take up permanent residence. That's why it's important that we're constantly eating probiotics, that they are a part of our day-to-day -day regimen. And I will talk about which ones and how to try to incorporate them. So even though these microorganisms, like some of them may not take up permanent residence, they definitely influence the microorganisms that are there. They actually do affect our immune cells, right? So they do have a very important role. So probiotics are very important. And these are the probiotic rich foods. These are some of the, the, some of the most common ones. <coughs> so remember, the probiotic is the actual microorganism itself, the live bacteria or whatever, or is yeast, all right? So it's alive <laughs> that we're eating. And what happens a lot of times with these foods is think about the transit time. Okay, so let's suppose our yogurt was made in, I don't know, the Chobani factory. And then, I don't know where the Chobani factory is. Let's just pretend, I don't know, Central, Central California, I don't know. 
And um, by the time that Chobani yogurt, you know, uh, gets to my store, right? It's gone through that travel time. Then it's sitting in the store, right? There's lights. I know it's refrigerated, but still, right? So some of those microbes, some of those probiotics do start to degrade, right? And then I bring it home. I leave it in my car. I leave it out, right? Some of them are degrading, right? So they're not 100% chock full of all these trillions of bacteria they originally started with, right? So that's why, again, it's important that we have diverse amounts of food. So we try to have some probiotics every day. So the highest amount of probiotics are actually in fermented foods. So fermented foods, you know, they start with some sort of uh, bacteria or yeast, right? And then they're allowed to um, proliferate, right? Um, so we're consuming these as a result, right? So yogurt. Now, I know some of you are lactose intolerant. So some of you are lactose intolerant. This is my recommendation. Again, it depends on how your tolerance levels is. Now, ob honestly, if you, okay, obviously, if you are allergic to dairy, that's a different story. Because allergic reaction versus lactose intolerance are two different things. Lactose intolerance basically is that you don't have enough of the enzyme the lactase to break down lactose, right? So there are a lot of foods where they add in the lactase, right? So that you're able to break it down and consume some of those dairy foods. Now, yogurt, because of the way that it's processed and, and made, um, some people that do have lactose intolerance can tolerate it in small amounts. So you can try it out and see, right? But if not, yes, there are other yogurts, um, the non-dairy yogurts that are hitting the marketplace hard. Um, and the reason I'm kind of laughing is uh, every time I go to the yogurt aisle, I'm like, what is going on here? Because there's so many yogurts, right? We got Icelandic yogurt. We got um, Greek yogurt. We got, you know, um, what else was it the other day? I saw goat's milk yogurt, sheep's milk yogurt. You name it, we got it. Every flavor that you can think of, right? Every flavor. Now, we just kind of have to be careful, you guys, with these yogurts, with the amount of sugar, because sugar drives the growth of not good organisms. There is nothing beneficial about sugar. Like, I know it tastes good, and that's about where it stops. There's no nutrient benefit to sugar. There is no good sugar. I can't tell you how many friends and family, what's a good sugar? What should I, or should I have? I'm like, none. <laughs> I mean, I'm just being honest, right? There's no good sugar. Some are a little bit better than others, but at the end of the day, they're all sweeteners in the body, right? Excessive amounts of sugar, our body uses what it can for energy, stores it as glycogen in the liver and in the muscle cells, and then there's, if there's an excess amount of sugar, which there is, it gets stored as triglyceride, as fat. And these sugars, this, this, sorry, the, the fats, can get into our cells and they can actually interfere with the cell signaling and then can create insulin resistance. And then we're now on the road to prediabetes and diabetes, right? So it's not sugar itself sometimes that's causing um, insulin resistance. It's the excessive amounts of sugar that then becomes the fat. It's the fat that does it. And even the fat that we're getting from saturated fats, right? Can also really done that, can do that in our body. So, we really have to be careful with this. You know, again, I know everyone wants to know, because tell me a good sugar, is it monk fruit? No, it's, it's still a sugar, right? Now, amongst the sweeteners, I have to be honest, I am partial to honey because that is our sunna food. And anything that our beloved Prophet Sallam ate are foods that we should be incorporating because they have benefits. So honey, and what's interesting enough, you guys, you're going to see this coming up. Honey has prebiotic. So that's coming up in a in, in in couple of slides. So I'm so happy to see that. But honey, we want to make sure it's local, raw, right, um, organic. You know, so we got to be careful with the honey. And we have to be careful with the amount. So this is the thing, you guys. I know this psychologically happens to us. This is good for me. Oh, I'm going to put a lot, right? It just happens psychologically. So I want you to remember moderation. You know, our Prophet always did everything in moderation. He did not have honey all the time. It was a luxury item, right? So same for us, moderation. Now, going back to yogurt. So when you're buying those yogurts, I know for those that have, um, you know, a sweet tooth, for those with children that are not going to eat plain yogurt, I get it. You know, 
you can get the flavored yogurts, but try not to get all the yogurts with all that extraneous stuff, right? The chocolate chips and the granola and this and that, that you're buying it with. If you want to make your own homemade granola, you know, that would be amazing. You know, you can make that and then you can add it to your yogurt, but try not to buy this stuff. You know, the prepackaged ones, like the flip top ones, avoid that. Try to keep it basic, right? If you have to, you know, maybe a vanilla or whatever, but just keep it basic. Look for less than 15 grams of sugar, right? And a lot of those non-dairy yogurts that I was looking at, the coconut yogurt and some of this stuff, they have a lot of sugar unnecessary amounts of sugar. So be careful, especially of those. I know there's a yogurt I saw the other day. I think it's like less sweetened. I forget what it's called now. I'm blanking out. I'm on brain, sorry. Um, but there are yogurts that do have less sugar. But the ideal thing, you guys, is just to get plain. Try to get the Greek yogurt. because That is chock full of um, probiotics. And Greek yogurt also is very high in protein because they've strained it um, so it's a lot more, I guess, condensed, you can say. So that would be actually a really good Sahur food, you know, is having some nice Greek yogurt, your homemade granola, some fruit, you know, that would be nice. So yogurt, very, very, very uh, high probiotic rich food. One teaspoon of yogurt has way more probiotic content than a supplement. So just keep that in mind, you guys. And you can even make your own, right? I know the Instapot, you can make your own yogurt. You can go hardcore and do it. Um, so that would be something maybe some of you can do, right? Kefir or kefir, um, however you want to say it. So kefir, this is that tangy, um, fermented, yogurty drink. It kind of tastes like lessee, but not. Um, but kefir, right? You can also, you can buy this anyway, anywhere. You even have it at Target. Um, again, I always recommend plain and then you can, you know, um, blend it with your favorite fruits, you know, drizzle a little bit of honey, but you can buy it, you know, strawberries and cream flavor, blueberry flavor. I mean, that's okay. That could be a good stepping stone. And that's the thing with this, you guys, is we're trying to train our palates, right? When we eat a lot of sugar, we get used to a lot of sugar, right? I'll give an example of myself right now. Um, I'm going to admit something. So I, the other day I was at Target, had a weak moment, bought some gelato, right? And um, so anyways, after fast broke, I'm like, oh, I want a little gelato. I took a you know, bite of it. I'm like, whoa, whoa, so sweet. Because I just wasn't used to it, you know? So you'll notice. And then I was like, eh, I'm kind of over it. Um, but you'll notice this, that when you retrain your palate, when you eat less sugar, you're not going to want it as much. And sugar is very inflammatory food. It messes up our gut bacteria. So anyways, back to kefir. So kefir, kefir has like 12 different probiotics. So what I want you guys to do is when you buy these fermented foods, like the yogurt, for instance, or whatever, turn the label over and look at where it says live active cultures. This is the bacteria and microbes that's in your item. The more the merrier, Right? Because we don't know which, kind of, which, which types we need and how much. So we want to have a diverse amount. Right? So the more, the merrier. You know, I personally, I want to be honest, I personally really like the, key, the kefir. I just do plain. I know it's not amazing tasting. I get it. I just kind of pinch my nose and just down it at iftar time. Um, but, you know, I've noticed, like for me personally, it really just helps me feel better. You know, so you'll notice this. So keep track again. How are you feeling? Cottage cheese, actually, also. Is very high in protein. Uh, cottage cheese a lot of times gets a bad rap. People think of it like as an old person food, but it's not. I want to reinvent cottage cheese, guys, but I'm not working on it right now. But cottage cheese, you know, is an excellent probiotic and you know source of, of protein. But be careful with cottage cheese because it can be high in sodium. So you want to pick like low sodium, or you know, have small amounts, and you know, have your your um, fruits with it. You know, I don't know if my roommate's on my old roommate. Say that. I don't know if you're online, but uh, one of my fondest memories of her is her cottage cheese and pineapple all throughout college, right? So that's actually a great combination. I don't know if she eats it anymore, but anyway, so cottage cheese and blueberries. So this would also be a really great Sahur food um, to have. So when you're getting tired of some of the foods, you know, I know we kind of, I know I feel like that a lot of times. Have some of that cottage cheese. It can help boost the, the protein content and help you feel satiated for longer. Buttermilk. I don't know who's drinking buttermilk plain, but anyways, 
Um, <laughs> so buttermilk is actually a probiotic rich food. There is, um, uh, what is it, lactoacidophilus milk that's rich in probiotics as well that you can consume. These are the dairy foods. And <clears throat> really quickly about kefir. Kefir, for those that are lactose intolerant, again, try a small amount, maybe a couple of ounces, see how you feel, you know, because like I said, sometimes smaller amounts um, people can tolerate better. But actually, I saw this on Target.com. They have a kefir making kit. So you can make non-dairy kefir, right? So maybe a project for the kids. Um, and that would be fine as well to get some of those probiotics in. Anyway, so moving on. Kimchi. Um, sauerkraut. Um, so these are basically fermented cabbage items, right? And now you can, it's everywhere in the marketplace, right? Kimchi, and it, you know, and a lot of restaurants, I was seeing it before we went in this lockdown, you know, kimchi, rice, and this and that. So you can do a lot of really cool stuff with it. Sauerkraut, there is so many different types with so many different flavors, and they taste amazing on a sandwich, right? Um, the different flavors. Uh, I know one of my buddies, you know, I had some for the first time at her place and it was so good, right? Um, garlic, because garlic is actually a, a prebiotic. Um, so they have those flavors as well. Anyway, so you can add that to your foods. Um, tempeh, miso paste and soup. Tempeh and miso, these are fermented soy. And I know a lot of times people get really phobic about soy. Oh, soy is gonna, you know, um, increased estrogen levels. It's going to cause, you know, feminization of men. No, we don't see that in the research, right? Even in terms of breast cancer, we do not see that in the research. If soy was a problem, we would see high incidence of breast cancer in the Asian countries, and we don't, right? So don't be scared of soy. Now, those that have thyroid issues, you know, just be careful. You don't want to have too much of it. Um, but I'm all about soy because it's rich in phytochemicals and antioxidants anti, um, um, that actually help us. You know, research actually shows that women who have been consuming soy from a young age have less symptoms, less menopausal symptoms, right? So that's something interesting to think about. It actually has a protective effect on the body. But a note about soy is our soy in the States is very, very different from you know, the Asian soy. Our soy, unfortunately, is genetically modified. Um, and unfortunately, it's not, you know, um, grown um, in ideal uh, environment. So that's why when you do buy, buy soy, make sure it's organic, make sure it's non-GMO. If you want to get the Asian soy, go for it. But small quantities, one serving, you know, like a six ounce glass of soy milk, you know, like um, half a cup of tofu, like that's fine and good every day. I love tofu. I mean, I like to just, you know, take firm tofu, I cut it into cubes, toss it in a little bit of olive oil and a little bit of some of that Asian chili garlic paste, and then um, bake it at 400 for like 20 minutes. And it's just like something that, you know, uh, I just like to just pop in my mouth and eat, you know, or you can stir fry some nice vegetables, some bok choy, some greens, and then have it with that you know, and that's a nice source of, of um, protein as well. But the tempeh and the miso, these are fermented soys, and you can buy them. I know Trader Joe's has tempeh that's already um, flavored. You can just cut it up, heat it, and just add it and eat it. Um, the miso paste soup would be really good as well. I know some of you are like, oh, gross, you know, and honestly, you guys, some of this stuff, I just tell people just, you know, plug your nose and just eat it and <laughs> just get used to it because the benefits are so amazing. Also really good research coming out on microalgae, um, so even seaweed, things like that. Kombucha tea and yeast. Now, I don't want to get into the fic about this and the alcohol and stuff like that, um, but in any case, kombucha uh, tea um, has fermented yeast and can be really beneficial. Um, and Napa cabbage, um, also excellent. Apple cider vinegar, what the mother? I don't know who named it mother, it sounds scary. <laughs> um, but apple cider vinegar, the mother is basically the, the, the bacteria, the other protein filaments and stuff. You can see it. So when you buy um, the vinegar, you want it to be, you know, not filtered. You want to see the mother. It'll indicate on there, organic, all that good stuff. Um, with apple cider vinegar, you want to, you know, add it, um, you know, to your uh, salads, maybe as part of a dressing. I wouldn't really down that stuff straight because it's very harsh on your enamel. I had a 
I have a friend who's a dentist and she was telling me that when this apple cider vinegar craze kicked up, she was seeing a lot of um, patients that actually had, um, you know, uh, degradation of enamel because they were just downing so much of it. So if you do apple cider vinegar, you can do little shots of it, just small amounts, you know, mix it with water. Um, the other day at Trader Joe's, I actually saw apple cider vinegar drink mix. It was like strawberry flavored with basil. I bought it. I didn't have it yet. Um, so interesting stuff is on the marketplace, but just, you know, keep it basic. Just get it, um, add it to your foods. Um, pickles, right? But you want the pickles and the pickled foods, pickled vegetables, to be pickled from salt and water, not vinegar, all right? So the fermentation is from the salt and water, not the vinegar. So those would be good as well. You can even make your own, you know, um, Sister Perry, I don't know if she's on, but she had sent me a fantastic um, sauerkraut um, recipe. So there's some really great stuff out there. And this would be great projects you can do with the family and then incorporate these foods. Now, I know some of you are looking at sourdough bread and soft cheese and feeling very excited about that. Notice it's an italicized writing and it's on the bottom. <laughs> because yes, those foods are good. They're amazing. We love how they taste. Um, I remember last year I was in San Francisco at the Boudin. Um, we passed by the Boudin factory and they were actually going to do a live demo of sourdough, sourdough bread making. And I really, really wanted to watch, but we were just didn't have time. But it's just so fascinating, you know, and I have a really good friend that actually hopefully she's going to do her sourdough starter course. I'm looking forward to that. But this is a great way um, that we can get the probiotics in. But just be careful because some of the commercial brand sourdough breads are made with enriched flour. And enriched flour in high amounts, and again, I'll talk about it next week, or not next week, excuse me, the next session with inflammation. But we don't want to have too much enriched flours because they can increase um, our blood sugar levels, our inflammation levels. Um, so we want to be careful with the amount of enriched flours that we're consuming. And unfortunately, a lot of the sourdough bread that are commercialized do have high amounts of enriched flour. I did see at Trader Joe's um, a whole wheat sourdough bread. I was really curious. I didn't buy it, but that would be a little bit better or even making your own would be fantastic, but just use it sparingly. Uh, and the soft cheeses, the Gouda, the Brie, things like that also, they're very high in saturated fat very high in sodium. So again, these would be like once in a while type of treats. Now, the criteria with the probiotics, hopefully everyone's doing okay. Wow, we just hit the one hour mark. If anyone wants to do a quick stretch, please feel free. If you want to stand up as you're listening to this, I hope you know, you're doing that. But if you need to stretch and take a break, please feel free. But I'm going to plow ahead <laughs> because there's so much to talk about. Um, but the probiotics, so this is the thing with probiotics, you guys. The organisms have to be consumed live. So I just mentioned this earlier, right? From farm or from you know production to table, you know there's a lot of room there for a lot of these organisms to die, right? So you know if we can make some of this stuff on our own, we're able to preserve some of those. Um, so, anyways, that's something just to think about. So the probiotics they have to be consumed live, and they have to be able to survive our digestive process. So I talked about that earlier on, right? Our digestive system, I mean, it's like a journey, right? We have all that stomach acid, right? That um, food has to like, you know, make it through, right? So these little guys, they have a really arduous journey to undertake. So they got to make it through our digestive system and still function. And then they got to be able to colonize our gut in high enough numbers, so that they can be ident identified in the stool. So this is the thing, you guys, there are a lot of companies that literally you can tell, send them in your stool sample and they'll tell you what bacteria you have and what bacteria you need. Just be aware of those things right now because there is not enough definitive research. We don't know how much of each bacteria we need. We don't know in what um, combinations we need. Right, I have um, one of my coworkers, she was telling me, I think her daughter um, was taking a lot of a probiotic, the same probiotic all the time, like actually very high amounts. And she actually started to get overgrowth of the microorganism, right? So we have to be careful of how we're doing this, right? Um, so in any case, the stools, this is the thing, guys, the stool doesn't tell the whole story because sometimes, these microbes, they can just, you know, be 
flushing out through our system and they end up in our stool. We don't know if they're actually colonizing our gut. The gold standard to know whether we have particular microorganisms in our gut is to take and do a biopsy. Now, again, I'm not recommending that. Do not go to your doctor. No doctor is doing that. Um, but this is what high quality research studies show. So the real high quality research studies will actually do gut biopsies to see what is actually in the gut itself. The stool doesn't tell the whole story sometimes. Anyway, that was a side tangent. Um, so this is the thing, you guys. The reason I'm bringing all of this up is in light of supplements. So supplements, probiotic supplements are huge, huge. And probiotics are not cheap, right? A month's supply can be 40 bucks, right? And as I mentioned, are all, are all of those organisms going to make it? Have these supplements been clinically tested? All right, I know some of you are online from South Africa. Welcome. But in here in the U.S., right, the supplement industry is not regulated. It's the wild, wild west out there. The supplement industry is regulated by themselves. So the manufacturer is the one that has to prove you know, the efficacy of their supplement. And there's a lot of room for error there. So a lot of these supplements have not been clinically tested, right? We don't know if what they're saying is actually in there. So we have to be careful with that. And a lot of these probiotics, we have to see, you know, take continuously to change the flora. But how do I know which one I need? Now, I'm going to come back to probiotic supplements in just a moment, but I got to take a little quick tangent here and talk about prebiotics. Prebiotics. These are even more important than the probiotics. So probiotics, the actual microorganism, the living creature. Prebiotics is what they eat, right? So let's suppose we're taking a supplement. Let's suppose we're eating the yogurt or whatever. You know, or let's, let's go back to the supplements. Let's suppose someone's like, you know what? I can't deal with this. I'm just going to eat my burger and fries and processed foods, but I'm going to take a probiotic just to cover my basis. And I, and I have a lot of patients like that. They just eat junk and they try to like, you know, make do by taking a multivitamin or taking a probiotic. And I'm like, that's nice and everything, but what are your probiotics going to eat once they get into your gut? Right? Rancid French fries, right? You know what I mean? So <laughs> we have to create an environment for these probiotics to thrive. And this is what I want us to focus on more so than the probiotics, is the prebiotics. What type of environment are we creating? Because the prebiotics are gonna encourage growth and activity of good bacteria. So all those foods that we weren't able to digest properly, all the fiber-rich foods, right? All those fiber components hit our gut and this is what the probiotics eat, right? So that's why we want to have a, a, a diet rich in fiber. And I'm not talking about fiber supplements. Right? I'm talking about the actual foods itself, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, lentils, beans, right? We got to incorporate all of this, right? So what happens is all this leftover fiber that's not digested, these little, you know, um, Microbes will get onto the uh, fiber and they're going to ferment it and they create these short chain fatty acids, which are very important for digestional and um, bowel health. They can actually help increase the activity of the immune function, help um, increase mineral absorption, decrease inflammation, and even colon cancer. So, some of these non digestible fibers, uh, legofructose, polydextrose, fructo oligosaccharides, galacto oligosaccharides, inulin, again, don't worry, there's not a quiz. But these are these different non-digestible fibers. And what's really interesting, everyone, is that I am actually seeing more of these fibers being added into our foods. I've seen them in like granola bars. I've seen them in like, I don't know, random stuff, which is nice and everything. So nice. Manufacturers are adding fiber in. But they're also adding them into foods that are not necessarily all that great for us. They're all this processed foods. And now they're adding this non-digestible fiber and pushing it as a marketing ploy. So this is the thing, these non-digestible non fibers are good for our body, but when they come in like that, you know, supplemental or form where they're added into food that's not supposed to be there, um, this is the thing, 
is they will cause excess bloating and gas. So watch out for that. If all of a sudden you're eating a new food, you know, maybe your kids are having a new granola bar and, you know, someone's tummy's off, it could be maybe because of some of these non-digestible fibers that they've added in. Here are some food related prebiotics. So this is my big thing and same for many of my colleagues in the nutrition field is we always tell people eat the real food. Supplements are like backup you know, maybe if you're deficient in something, if you've had labs done and you're deficient and your practitioner has told you, then that's a different story. But be careful with some of these supplements that we're just taking on our own because, hey, I saw an infomercial or, oh, wow, I saw it on, on Instagram. My favorite influencer is taking this and that influencer has no background um, in the field. So just be careful of some of this stuff. Always get the food and have it itself, but there is a protective effect in the food itself, right? For example, um, years ago, they did this huge study on smokers because smokers are at higher risk of cancer, right? So they're like, okay, we're going to give them high quantities of antioxidants, vitamins A, C, and E, because antioxidants can actually help our body fight against cancer and other diseases. So they're like, let's just give them in a supplement, mega doses. They had to actually stop the study because it backfired, right? Because this is the thing, you guys, food. Allah has given food in the perfect form. So eat it in its non-processed real form. So these are some of the prebiotic rich foods. And this is just some of many. Um, so overall, I want us to eat more vegetables and fruits and whole grains. Yes, whole grains. I know some of you are going to be like, oh, I thought grains are bad. This is the thing, you guys, the whole ancient grains in their non-processed forms is actually extremely beneficial for our body. Bulgur, barley, uh, amaranth, quinoa, kamut, millet, um, wheat berries, all of this stuff is amazing. Now, if any of you have you know, gluten issues, and I'm not going to talk about gluten in this, that's a whole other beast. I'm going to talk about it in inflammation. Um, but anyone that has a gluten sensitivity you would be watching out for wheat, rye, and barley. Wheat, rye, and barley. All right, so if you're avoiding gluten because of a clinical issue, then you would be avoiding those things. But for the rest of us that don't have a clinical issue, having barley, having rye, those are good. So get in those non-processed um, grains, right? You can buy them anywhere, right? Um, packaged, um, loose you know, add it to your salad, add it as your sides instead of rice. Maybe you have some of that quinoa. And I'm not talking about large quantities, literally a quarter of a plate. Very small amount is all we really need, right? This really helps feed our bacteria very beneficial, unique fibers that we're not going to get from other things. And also, interestingly enough, I know a lot of women are going to like this, um, but interestingly enough, we've seen research that shows that when you are incorporating those whole ancient grains, it actually helps reduce some of that belly fat, right? So again, small quantities. I'm not saying you have your whole entire plate as, you know, your grain, but like small quantities is actually very, very beneficial. And again, ideally in its non-processed form. So I don't want you guys to be like, yeah, wow, I just went and I found quinoa, amaranth, um, corn tortilla chips. Okay, I have to make a disclaimer. I have that in my cupboard. But in any case, that's a once in a while thing. But that's not what I'm talking about in this case. I'm talking about the real deal right? Uh, grain. So that's beneficial. And our beloved prophet, he would incorporate grain. That's what they ate, right? They ate bread, but not like fancy bread like we're eating, right? Um, but you know, the grainy type of bread that they had at that time, again, we'll talk more about this in the, in the next session. So please do incorporate um, the whole grains. Now notice I didn't say wheat because wheat is very different than previous generations wheat. So if you want to avoid wheat, I'm fine with that, right? But I'm not fine with people like totally avoiding grains, especially the whole grains itself. And again, we always want to pick high quality grains. You know, we want them to be organic, not grown with the pesticides, you know? So we want to look for that stuff. You know, I know a lot of times people avoid the grains for different reasons. And a lot of those reasons actually deal with the way the grains are grown. If they have pesticides added to them, it's the pesticides that have issues not the grain itself. 
Now, wheat, again, is different because it's genetically modified. It's, it's different than before. So, you know, you can have it, um, but, you know, I, I, that's not what I lump into the prebiotic, you know, ancient grains that I am recommending. Anyway, so asparagus stalks, Jerusalem artichokes, very, very high as a prebiotic. Bananas, yay. Bananas always get a bad rap from people, right? Especially diabetics. I can't tell you how many times people tell me, oh, well, I'm diabetic. I can't have banana. It's high in sugar. No, you guys, don't look at fruit as sugar. Fruit has fructose and fiber. It is different. It is God's dessert to us. So please don't avoid fruit. I get so phobic when people are avoiding fruit for these reasons, yet they have no problem avoiding donuts. Please do that. Let's prioritize here, okay? Um, so avoid those other processed sweets, but don't avoid fruit. So many benefits of fruit. They even had a research study where people were eating like, I don't know, like 20 servings of fruit and had no detrimental um, aspects to it. In fact, it was beneficial. I'm not recommending eating 20 servings of fruit. We want to have, um, you know, a mixture of foods that we're having. But all I'm saying, you guys, is don't be scared of fruits. Do not be scared of bananas. Enjoy it. It's prebiotic. Um, barley, beans, beets, broccoli stalks. So that's the part we a lot of times just toss, right? The stalk itself, you guys, it, the floret is excellent as well, but the stalk itself is chock full of antioxidants and phytochemicals. They've actually done, it was fascinating. They did this research study where they took broccoli and um, they had the cancer cells in a Petri dish and they like squirted some of the broccoli, you know, uh, mixture, I guess you can say, onto the, the cancer cells. They saw a shrinkage of the cell. Now again, this was in a lab and a lot of times we can't extrapolate what happened in the lab into the human body. But just that like, aspect, like just thinking about that, you know, it's just fascinating, right? So when we think of things on this level, you guys, and share this with your children, that will help us to eat some of these things. That, wow, guys, look, I'm having blueberries. Blueberries are increasing the natural killer cells in my body, the immune cells. We have seen an increase in immune cells from consuming blueberries. Now, again, you guys, be moderate in everything you're eating. I don't want a blueberry binge here. But I'm just saying, that when you think about food on this level of communicating with ourselves, communicating with our body, activating genes on or off, for example, citrus fruit, we know rich in vitamin C. Vitamin C is a precursor to collagen. I'm not going to talk about collagen in this session. I'll talk about it next time. Because there's a lot of controversy about collagen supplements and, you know, any case. But the precursor to collagen is vitamin C, right? So having vitamin C, you get that in the citrus. And also, interestingly about the citrus fruits, is that if you zest the citrus, the skin itself can actually reverse DNA damage. Fascinating, amazing. So when our DNA gets damaged, God forbid, as we're aging, this can help reverse that. So think about food on that level. So back to broccoli stalks, you know, um, I keep talking about Trader Joe's. I was just at Trader Joe's the other day. That's why it's like in my head. But Trader Joe's actually has a broccoli, you know, slaw mixture where it has the stalks of the broccoli already cut up for you. So you can get that, you know, add some apples to it, because um, apple a day does keep the doctor away, walnuts, and you can have a really amazing, nice salad. Um, Brussels sprouts, amazing as well. I'm planning to grow some. Actually, I am growing them. Let's see how it turns out. But this is actually really amazing. Carrot peel. So when we you know, peel the carrots, maybe leave some of the peels on. When you're de-stringing the celery, leave some of the strings on. Because all those like components that we have a hard time chewing, these are actually really good fodder the probiotics. Chicory, dandelion greens, flax, amazing. Flax, you want to grind up um, to have the powder itself. That's a very potent anti-inflammatory as well. Uh, but you can also have flax in its whole form as a seed. It has a laxative effect, um, which sometimes um, some people may need. They're constipated. Garlic, um, honey. I had to put a little asterisk next to honey because I was so excited. Um, but honey, again, moderate amounts. Um, leeks, oats, onions, so, forth, so on and so forth, as you guys can see. Seaweed and microalgae also have prebiotics. So this is the food we need to be incorporating um, as well as those probiotics. We also want to boost the fiber. For women, we need to have 25 grams of fiber a day. For men, about 35 grams of fiber a day. So um, here are some fiber-rich foods. Um, I was looking at dates. I really wanted dates to have a lot of fiber. 
Um, they do, but they're not in the high caliber fiber foods, but they are a really good source of potassium and magnesium and glucose and everything else. But here are the high fiber foods. Um, check out the little pearled barley. Um, whole wheat pasta, I'm going to give a disclaimer there. I'd rather you eat other pastas than whole wheat. You can do the lentil. You can do uh, the bean. Um, but look at some of these other foods, right? Black beans, 15 grams in a cup. That's more than a day's of value. So making a nice chili, you know, with the black beans, putting some avocado on it. I love avocado, right? As Californians can't live without our avocado. But avocado is actually also very high in fat. Yes, I get it. It's a beneficial fat, but it's still a fat. So go easy on it. You can get those little small little mini avocados, cut it in half, have half one day, have half the next day, and you're good to go. So, you know, really load up on the fiber foods. So I'll talk more, uh, more about this subject next um, session, but you know, the best plan is our prophetic plan. When people talk to me about the keto diet, people talk to me about paleo, when people talk to me about like all this other stuff out there, I'm like, look, let's go back for those of us who are Muslim to our tradition, right? Prophet Islam had the most ideal lifestyle, right? So nutritionally wise, non-processed foods, look at the ingredients. Do I know what is going in my body? Do I want it there? Do I know what some of this stuff is? right? It's beyond just looking for ingredients to look for gelatin, okay? We need to look at what is the quality. Do I understand this? If you have kids that are big on junk food, tell them, read the ingredients. Can you pronounce that? Go look it up. What is that? Is that a chemical? You know, so we have to think about this because we are what we eat. Less meat. Now, some of these like keto and paleo, they're eating so much meat. It's ridiculous. Like meat and vegetables. And you know what? Yeah, okay, fine. In the short term, it can help you lose weight. But what is happening to your body long term? Right? When people are cutting out carbs, um, that's one of my biggest pet peeves is when people are like, I'm carb, I'm low carb. I'm like, why? Throughout humanity, we always ate carbs. Human beings ate carbs. They had fruits, they had grains, they had corn, they had beans, they had lentils. Don't do away with those foods, right? So, you know, really, I always tell people, like, think about our ancestors. And I'm going to think about, you know, a couple hundred years ago, what did our people eat? What was our body used to? Our body wasn't used to constant eating. Our body use, wasn't used to this constant snacking. When we're eating at night, like later into the, into the night, I know right now with Ramadan, everything is just, you know, off schedule and different, you know, it's a different right now. But like, think about some of that, you know, snacking after dinner. That's unnecessary, totally unnecessary. We just had dinner, right? And then people are snacking and nobody's snacking on carrot sticks after dinner, right? It's like carrot cake, right? So when we are snacking at night after hours, our body's actually not used to that because think about our ancestors. They slept relatively soon after the sun set, right? Because what are they going to do? And I mean, at that time they didn't have electricity anyways, but there was, you don't see these people like, you know, uh, up till 2 a.m., right? Who did that? Um, so they slept early and they got up early. That's what our human body's used to. So when we start consuming all these snacky foods or foods like later on in the evening, what's happening is our gut bacteria is actually, the microbiome is like cleaning out the toxins, right? Our uh, different hormone values decrease at night, right? There's a difference. And so what happens is now all of a sudden we eat. So then the body like, it goes on, basically, you can say. Now the gut microbiome is like, oh, wow, now food's coming in. So now instead of us cleaning out the gut, now we got to help digest. You see what I'm saying? So like things shift at night. So we have to keep that in mind. And again, Ramadan, different story. But after Ramadan, have your dinner. Have your dinner earlier on in the evening. Pick a time, right? Maybe you cut off your eating two, three hours before bedtime. All right? Now, again, for those that are diabetic, it's different for you. So if any of you are diabetic, please contact me separately because diabetics, we have to regulate your blood sugar. We have to make sure you are eating frequently. So for you, just this is different right now, okay? But for those that are not diabetic, you, you cut your last meal sooner in the evening 
And I always tell my patients, I'm like, have a really complicated nighttime regimen, right? Floss and water pick and I don't know, make it hard so that when you eat, it really makes you think twice. <laughs> Do I really want to go through all that again? I can't tell you how many times I'm like, I already brushed my teeth. I don't want to eat. You know, it just really stopped me. Do what you got to do. Close the kitchen for the night. Put up signs. Stop. It's over. Right? I wish I could invent a fridge that had like a little retina scan that would open if you had like certain blood sugars. All right. Because we just constantly are grazing. We don't need to do that. Right. In the prophetic plan, there was not this grazing. We ate less food, small amounts of food. Right? We always hear about this, that, you know, one third water, one third air, one third food, right? But the precursor to that hadith is that if you are going to eat, right? So first of all, do you even need to be eating? But if you are, keep it to this amount. So eat less, slow it down, slow it down. We eat really, really fast. So slow it down, eight to 10, choose um, you know, uh, the prophetic plan, we did have whole grains in the non-processed form, lots of fruits and vegetables, things like that. Dates, black seeds, all that good stuff. Cucumbers, right? There's this slide, a uh, little picture here with the cucumbers, with the dates, right? Because of the hot and cold composition, right? That's also in our tradition as well. <coughs> we have great people in our community who are well-versed in the prophetic and prophetic medicine and functional medicine, please contact them, reach out to them. They can give you more information on your temperament, you know, whether you're more of a hot or cold, because that really does have effect on how food is affecting your body. Like my mom was just telling me this the other day, actually, she was having a lot of leg pain. And she's like, you know what? I realized it's because I started adding a lot of black seed. Now black seed's good, right? Um, it's Shafa in the black seed, but she was eating too many. And it was actually making her legs hurt. And when she stopped and she decreased the amount, she noticed she felt better. So think about food in this way as well, you know? So in any case, another really good eating plan that helps balance things out um, and does incorporate a lot of our prophetic um, ideals is the Mediterranean diet um, pyramid. And when, when I'm saying diet, you guys don't think of diet like, you know, a crash diet. Like, I'm just going to be on it. Then I'm going to go off after I lose my weight. Think of this as a lifestyle. So, you know, being more plant-based is really being pushed and encouraged in the nutrition and medical field. Right? I'm actually involved in a program where we do have people that are totally plant-based, no oils, none of that stuff. And we do see vast benefits um, in their health. I mean, it's hard, um, but they do see benefits. But in our tradition, we need balance right? We, sh we can have meat. We shouldn't actually totally do away with meat, by the way. That's not part of the sunnah. You know, our Prophet he didn't eat meat that often. He certainly didn't eat red meat that often, right? Small quantities once in a while. And that's exactly what the Mediterranean diet pyramid here is showing. Meat once a week now. Now some of you are freaking out, okay? Just whatever you're eating right now, just decrease the amount. Maybe just a little small portion. Um, maybe once, once a day you're having your meat. Um, and this is coming from a meat lover. I love meat. But, you know, we need to be cognizant of how much we're having um, because, again, high amounts of meat is very inflammatory on the body. Right? I've had patients who cut out the red meat and they're like, oh, my gosh, my joints feel so much better. Right. So think about that red meat. Again, if you're getting high quality red meat, grass fed, free range, massaged, I don't know, you know, really high quality red meat. Okay, fine. Excellent. But even then. Use small amounts of it, right? Bone broth, you know, a lot of people are into bone broth, which is excellent, you know, but again, small quantities, uh, make sure it's high quality bones that you're using. Um, so anyways, just be cognizant of the quality of the meats that you're having. Watch how much you're having. Um, poultry eggs, you know, two, three, two, three times a week. You know, even that, you know, be careful. A lot of times I've seen this with people. They're like, oh, wow, red meat, I'm going to decrease. So I'm going to eat lots of chicken because that's healthier. No, even chicken and turkey, right? Even that in excessive amounts can be inflammatory. And also, we've even seen certain diseases within the, you know, poultry, right? Avian flu, things like that, right? Right now, we're contending with a virus that came from a bat or whatever that is, right? So, you know, we got to just be careful of sometimes of an over-influx of, of animal protein. Just kind of tone it down. In other countries, protein is a luxury. Sorry, animal protein, animal meats, 
are like luxury items, special occasions, right? I always say this about our ancestors, right? Let's suppose our ancestors had one cow and a couple of chickens. They weren't slaughtering meat every day and eating that, right? They had more of the beans and lentils and carbs and fruits and vegetables. Think of it that way. Seafood, yes, seafood is excellent. Um, including omega-3 rich seafood. Omega-3s are beneficial fats that are good for our brain and our heart health. Some of the best forms of omega-3s come from algae and plankton, which we're not eating yet, but stay tuned for that. Um, so we eat the um, seafood that eat them to get the benefits. So the omega-3 rich fish are salmon, mackerel, herring, tuna, trout, sardines, right? So these are high in omega-3s. Um, that doesn't mean that other fish are not high in omega-3s. They're good, but they're not as great as these. So I call these the fishy fish, right? They taste really fishy to me. Um, but even amongst the fishy fish, you know, the, the omega-3 rich fish and fish in general, we are overfishing in the world, right? We're going to see a decrease in a lot of these populations of fish during you know, our lifetime. So we really have to be aware of that. And when you're having fish, remember there's contaminants in the water, right? Remember like, you know, some years back when that um, nuclear plant explosion or whatever um, in Japan, all that radiation was in the water, right? Um, so a lot of times our wild seafood wildlife is really sensitive to what's in the water. Does that mean farm raised is better? Not necessarily. A lot of the farm raised fish, they're also being fed weird stuff, grains and oils and things like that. So we honestly want to try to get wild caught. We want to make sure that we are diversifying our fish. Don't be like salmon, 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 salmon all the time. Mix it up so we have less exposure to the contaminants. We only really need to have seafood maybe you know, twice a week, the like size of a, um, um, a deck of cards, like twice a week. You know? Now, for those of you that are like, no, I don't like fish. Okay, no problem. Don't worry about it. Sorry, really quickly. For those that do eat fish, be careful of how you're preparing the fish. So if you're like, yeah, I love fish or deep fry it and, you know, watch how you're preparing it. Um, but in any case, for those that don't like fish, we can get omega-3s from flax, seeds, from walnuts, from soy. Um, so there's other sources of omega-3s that we can get. Anyways, the, the, the foundation of the pyramid here is fruits and vegetables. There's olive oil there. Now, again, olive oil is anti-inflammatory. It could be even anti, um, it's like, like a natural aspirin in our body. But just watch how much you're using. Get good quality olive oil. I have a you know, good friend that's, or good friends that are Palestinian. They have some hardcore Palestinian olive oil. Get something like that. Use small amounts, you know because it still is high in fat, you know, but don't go crazy with some of this stuff, everything in moderation. And the bottom part of the, of the uh, Mediterranean pyramid, it's not on here, but it's actually physical activity and social interactions. And I'm going to save those topics for next session. We talk about inflammation. Okay. We're running out of time, but we're going through. Hang in there, guys. To supplement or not. So this is the thing, you guys more research needs to be conducted. We don't know, again, I keep saying this over and over, what the right amount is. We don't know what types of, of, of organisms that we need. So there's a lot of unknowns, everyone, a lot of unknowns. So this is the thing, is that if you want to get their probiotic, you know, just make sure that whatever probiotic that you're getting, that there is research behind the strain. Right? So for example, earlier I mentioned Floristore. So Floristore actually, Floristore, um, actually is good for those people that are, are taking antibiotics or that maybe are dealing with you know, diarrhea because of the antibiotic or sickness or whatever. Then, okay, fine, you, you can take that because we've seen that in the research. But some of these other brands that are out there, and you know, just be wary. So if you're going to get supplements, make sure that you check the expiration date. Right, Because remember, the longer they're sitting on the shelf, the decreased amount of probiotic in there. All right. Um, you want to make sure that you see the U, oh my gosh, I forgot, USP. Yeah, USP symbol so that, or NSF symbol, so, so to make sure that whatever is in there has been corroborated to be in there. Um, 
you, if you're going to get them, you know, you can get refrigerated. Although now they have strains that are freeze dried that don't need to be refrigerated. So that's nice. Refrigerated usually would be a little bit better. You want to make sure they're in dark containers. You want to look, make sure the sugar is limited in the product. And the data shows that you've got to make sure there are at least 5 billion colony forming units. You want to see more than 5 billion um, organisms in there. It's best to take with food and diversify, right? So don't just get stuck on one supplement. Mix it up. Maybe one day, one time I get this a particular brand. I finish that brand. I get another one. So mix it up. But the thing is, you guys, there's really not that much evidence on the supplements itself. We need more evidence. Personally, and again, I used to take supplements and then I kind of stopped and I used to just, I just now try to get it through the food. I was on antibiotics a little bit of a time ago. So that's when I did take my floor store with it um, to kind of help me. But now that I'm off, I just turn to food. That's the best thing. So again, but if you're feeling sick or if you're like, no, I swear by the supplement, it definitely makes me feel better, then go ahead. Um, how do you know that these um, supplements are effective? Are you feeling less flatulence? Are you feeling less bloating? Better digestion. Do you see an improvement in skin, improvement in mood? Do you see a change in feces? Now, <laughs> I was almost, but I didn't on this slide show what feces should look like, but then it's kind of graphic. So I'm just going to have you refer to the online world. Our stool, we should be looking at it, right? Um, because even the stool itself can tell how our health is, right? So if you have stool that's like little, you know, bullets, um, that means you're constipated. So we don't want to see that. We want to see firm stool. Um, so do you see a difference in your species after these supplements? So these, these are some of the things to look out for. But remember, you guys, we also have the placebo effect <laughs> that can play a role. Because when we feel a certain way about something, then as soon as we see those effects, you see what I'm saying? Like, I'll give an example. Um, some years ago, I was really stuck on airborne. I'm like, airborne, it's the best. It boosts my immune system. I feel great. It helps me fight disease. And then I remember uh, sometime later, there's a research study that showed that actually airborne does nothing. But I'm like, what? But on me, I totally felt better. So probably a little bit of a placebo effect there. So if that's how you're feeling with some of these probiotics, go for it. Honestly, do what makes you feel best. But my just advice to you is make sure there's 5 billion at least organisms, do different types, mix it up, right? And um, but don't rely on them solely. Also make sure you're taking, getting good sources of prebiotics and food, or probiotic food. Here are some possible uh, potential contraindications to taking probiotics. If you're taking antibiotics, the antibiotic is like a little, um, what's it called? Uh, atomic bomb to our gut. It wipes everything out, good and bad. So if you're taking probiotics, antibiotics, you know, sometimes, you know, may not work. It depends on the strain. For those that are taking PPI or H2 inhibitors for um, GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease, if you've been on these PPI and H2 inhibitors for years, for decades, you may not want to take the probiotics because, again, this is actually inhibiting some of the acid production in the body. Talk to your doctor about that. I'm talking about years and years. If you're just on a short-term, different story. Um, and stress can actually also affect some of these probiotics too. What's harmful to the gut, you guys? So I talk about some of this stuff. A diet high in sugar can stimulate the growth of certain unhealthy bacteria in the gut. Artificial sweeteners. Nobody should be using artificial sweeteners unless you have diabetes. And even then, there are very limited ones that you should be using. And in small quantities, you know, uh, maybe like the stevia you know, has been okay for diabetics in small quantities. The rest of us can have regular sugar, but just small amounts of it because the artificial sweeteners do shift the beneficial bacteria in the intestines. We want to decrease the red meat, especially beef. Red meat, excessive amounts of red meat um, cause the growth of a particular bacteria that creates this byproduct called TMAO. And TMAO actually affects, um, what's it called, the, the arterial wall linings. It can make us more susceptible to that plaque formation and cardiovascular disease as an effect. So decrease the red meat, generally speaking, once or twice a month, 
I know some of you are like, what? So once a week, just decrease, you know, the, the red meat. And that would actually also include the lamb and goat and things like that too. Um, we want to increase the healthy fats, like the omega-3s, which I talked about earlier. And we want to reduce those processed foods. Sorry to show you this picture before iftar time, but in any case. <laughs> Here are some foods to aim for regularly. In interest of time, I'm actually going to show this slide again in the next session and talk about it more. So I'll come back to this next session. Don't worry, it'll come back. Is it only the food that's affecting my microbiome? No, it's our sleep as well. Our circadian rhythms actually regulate our GI functions. So lack of sleep can actually increase these pro-inflammatory cytokines, which I'll talk about next session, which can lead to low-grade chronic inflammation, which can then affect our gut microbiome. So sleep, generally speaking, you know, six to nine hours, it really de depends. You know, um, look at the quality of your sleep. You know, I had this whole discussion with um, a friend about like, you know, we can sometimes sleep less amount of sleep, but sometimes Allah puts a lot of barakah and blessings in that sleep. So even though it might be less sleep, you might have so much barakah in there, it was like 10 hours, right? So it's like, oh, just look sometimes at the time itself, you know, but Overall, everyone try to sleep earlier. The recommendation is always to sleep after, you know, relatively soon after um, Isha, you know, get up early, uh, Tajid, Fajr, so on and so forth. You know, obviously right now is Ramadan, it's different, but just be aware of your sleep. And I'll talk more about this next session. Exercise, contraction of the skeletal muscle leads to immunity enhancement. We boost our immune system by exercise. It's one of the best anti-inflammatories that we can do, but be careful of some of that hardcore like intense training exercise because that actually can increase inflammation so that can backfire so we want to have moderate exercise you want to be doing hit sessions all the time that's actually not beneficial we want to mix it up and the best things we can do that's also good for cognitive health is walking right so a nice walk like right before iftar is amazing so our goal for exercise is 30 minutes at least five days a week um, you know, try to fit it in even as you're fasting, you know, even if it's 20 minutes, 15 minutes, there's great videos on YouTube you can do. And I'm going to my last slide, guys, you made it. Um, other ways to increase our diversity of our microbiome, get a pet, right? Not a fish, that's not going to cut it, <laughs> but, you know, a cat or whatever. Again, it's up to your family, everyone's different, you know, and very cultural. <laughs> Um, but sometimes, you know, you know, research and studies have shown that it's actually the decreased risk for childhood obesity and allergies, you know, with pets, they actually are bringing in also different microbes, which, you know, you're being exposed to again, not for everybody <coughs> gardening, getting your hands dirty and fresh soil. This, um, really introduces our immune system to all these microorganisms and the plants gardening can decrease our stress gets us out in the fresh air you can grow your own food that you don't have to wash and disinfect <laughs> um open the window hose you know get that fresh air in i actually saw an ad for a probiotic air blower blower i was like what's happening the people are really taking probiotics and running with it right you'll see a lot of like probiotic lotions and stuff like that just you know, be aware of some of these gimmicks now this next one is very ironic considering what's going on right now. But yes, decreasing the use of those antibacterial products. And this is a whole session in itself in light of the COVID. I know right now we're very concerned. We don't want that um, virus. You know, we're doing all sorts of stuff. And it really makes me think, are we doing too much? Do I have to Lysol everything, right? Can I just maybe wipe it down with some soap and water, just that friction, right? Now, again, you know, we don't know, you know, how this virus is, truly spreading and things like that. But I'm not gonna lie, I am concerned at the long-term repercussions of all of these exposure of toxins. So maybe we can get some of those, you know, other cleaning products that aren't, you know, hydrogen peroxide and all this stuff, you know, again, everyone's different, you know, I don't wanna get really into this, but I just wanna raise awareness on this. You know, uh, we may not need antibacterial soap because if we're washing our hands, just use regular soap and do the 20 seconds, get that friction in there. That's all that's really needed. So just watch out for that. You know, again, right now in this era, you know, I, I, we just don't know. But um, you know, hopefully, inshallah, this is over soon. And when it is, you know, watch how much of these um, 
products that you're using. And then last but not least, and we'll talk about this next session, is stress management and self-care, right? We're in a very blessed month right now for us Muslims, you know, and time of introspection, time of really connecting with our Lord, you know, so this is one of the best self-care. I know there's a lot of great, you know, apps out there to help with mindfulness, you know, and those are great, but, you know, just praying and just speaking to our Lord from the heart is one of the best sources of self-care and stress management that we can do. So we made it, everyone. Thank you. We did it. Two hours. Mashallah. Um, by the way, I don't know if you're on, if you're there, what's going on, but um, I don't know if we have time for questions. Um, let me see what some of the questions are here. I wish I could open the room up here. Okay, so I'll try to go through some of the questions I have. Um, okay, so... Do you recommend exercising after opening the fast as a lifestyle change? Yes. And I'm going to talk, I didn't talk about intermittent fasting here because I'm going to talk about it more um, in the next session, but intermittent fasting helps decrease our inflammation and it helps with our gut microbiome. And what we, and research actually shows this, that after Ramadan, we see less inflammatory markers in people. So if any of you, you know, um, you know, sometimes, you know, feel like this fasting is hard and it is, you know, but not only is it a spiritual benefit, but we're getting medical benefits um, to it too. So for exercising, honestly, whatever it works in your day, right? For some people, you know, after the fast, maybe after Isha or something, when you have something in your system, you can do a nice workout, you know, um, right before for some people, I know they're able to do that. You know, I personally will go for a quick walk, like right before iftar, like seven o'clock, it's like, you know, I'm not doing any crazy walking, just light walk, you know, do my zikr or whatever as I'm walking, you know, that I found to be calming and beneficial. Um, so it doesn't really matter. Whenever it fits into your day um, is the best time to exercise. I missed it. What did you say about acid production and probiotics? So this is the thing, I don't know about, um, so for those that are on um, um, the heartburn medications for like years, years, I'm talking about like decades, they're on some of these PPIs and H2 inhibitors. What happens is they reduce acid production. And as we age, we have less acid production anyways in our body, right? So um, in any case, so for those that are on PPIs, um, sometimes those probiotic, like the actual supplements are not um, really recommended. But again, this is for those that have been on for years. If you're on it for a short term, it's not a problem. Now, um, I didn't get into heartburn here because uh, I'm going to talk about it in the next section, next session because inflammation um, could potentially cause some of the heartburn. So we'll talk about it more um, in the next session. Do I have any suggestions of pre-made halal powder, gelatin, or bone broth to buy? Make it yourself is my recommendation, honestly. Um, because what happens is again, when we're processing this and it's being made, right, it's removing some of those beneficial qualities. Um, so I don't have any ones, um, in and of themselves because I don't use them. I know there are brands out there, um, that are good. Um, but the bone broth, the best thing is you make it yourself. Get some really good quality bones. Um, you know, use your Instapot, right? Let it simmer for the good, you know, amount of time. Um, so that's actually the best way. And I know, I know someone here locally who does make, you know, um, bone broth that, you know, um, you can purchase from, you can look in your local area, but the best thing is to make it itself. Because again, it's not that process. When we are, you know, buying some of these pre-made um, mixtures, you know, we're losing some of those benefits. Um, what do I mean by carrot peel? So, you know, when you're peeling the carrots, um, so sometimes the peel, it's the, the outer peel has some of those um, prebiotic benefits. So maybe keep some of it on. I know it doesn't taste good. I'm not saying keep all of it on, but maybe just some of them um, could be helpful. Um, thank you, Lena, for referencing my talk. What about the vegan argument that drinking cow's milk or having yogurt puts a lot of stress on the digestive um, system and can contribute to inflammation in the body? So that's really a good question um, because yes, our dairy is very different. And again, everyone's different in how they are, their bodies are able to handle this. Some people can't handle dairy. That's why I mentioned earlier on to see how you feel with certain foods. So dairy, um, sugar, um, and wheat are some of the, the, the three things that 
really I want us to pay close attention to. So if you're consuming dairy and you're like, no, it just makes me feel um, sick, I'm fatigued, I'm breaking out, um, I just feel inflamed, then don't do it. You know, um, because yes, cow's milk does have estrogen in there. There is in there. So if you're going to get the cow's milk, you know, organic, you know, grass fed, all that. Um, but there are other milks that you can do, right? There's um, the, the organic, you know, non-sweetened soy milk. Um, there's the um, almond milk. You can even make your own, making your own almond milk would even be better because then you are getting more of the almonds. When they make almond milk, it's actually just a couple of almonds and a filler. So making your own almond milk would be amazing. Um, so um, all these different non-dairy. So yes, there is definitely legit um, validity to um, the dairy pudding, you know, increasing inflammation, but it's not for everyone. So it's not for everyone, basically. Everyone's different. In terms of yogurt, if it's really good quality yogurt, um, that with the probiotics, the way it's processed, it should actually be beneficial for the body. But again, if you're hesitant, you don't want to do it, um, then there are those other non-dairy yogurts that are um, good as well. Kefir seems to have a lot of sugar. That's because you're getting the kefir that has sugar. You just want to get plain sh um, sugar. Oh, sorry, sorry, excuse me, plain kefir. Um, oh, thank you, Rahma, telling me what to answer life. Um, so does plain yogurt also have sugar? So this is the thing, you guys, when you look at plain yogurt, plain kefir, and then you look at where it says sugars, yes, you'll see some sugar because that is lactose. Lactose is a naturally occurring milk sugar. It's not sugar in the detrimental form. The detrimental form, you guys, is the added sugar that's not supposed to be there. So for example, if I had mango kefir, right? So that's the sugar that they're you know, getting from the mangoes and all the other sugar that they're adding. Plain yogurt should be fine. So yes, it has natural sugar that we should not be scared of. Don't be scared of lactose. When you're stressed and starting to have anxiety, how long should we, should we do clean eating for and reset our gut? Okay, great. So our gut can reset as quick as two days, right? So it can be really quick. Um, but the thing is, we also have to work on all angles, on the stress angle. We have to work on getting some physical activity in, right? We have to make sure that we're eating well, we're eating clean. And clean eating, you guys, sh shouldn't be like a once you know, in a while type of thing. We should try to eat clean overall. And by clean, I mean, not, you know, watch how much processed foods you're eating. Don't go overboard on the sugars, you know, watch your meat consumption. You know, we want to be moderate. We want to be moderate. But I'm not saying don't have fun stuff. Have some fun stuff. You know, have a little bit, maybe every day, 100 calories, just keep it to that. But overall, just try to eat well. But our gut can reset pretty quickly. So it could be, you know, a matter of days, um, if you've had, you know, significant trauma, it could be weeks or more, but it can be, again, it depends per person, but it can be relatively, relatively quick. Um, any other questions? Can you address FODMAPs? Oh yes, that's a whole, a whole other area. Um, I think I'll try to do FODMAPs next session because um, that is quite um, a big topic. FODMAPs are basically non-digestible non components. Um, from carbohydrates and for people that have like IBS and things like that we found that when people are on a FODMAP diet when they've reduced or re eliminated some of those um, products that it's like healing for the gut for the people we see less you know uh, of the symptoms um, but some of those FODMAPs are actually some of the prebiotics that we recommend but it really depends again on one's gut, gut one's gut health what else is going on so this is where again the indiv individualization would would come into play. Um, uh, okay, will I be talking about healing the gut in the next session? This was pretty much what this session was, my friend. Um, so everything I just talked about here, everything, the foods we're eating, the stress management, the exercise, everything I just talked about here, this whole session, hopefully should help us, inshallah, to heal the gut. If we start to implement these things, you will see a difference. Next session is more on inflammation. Inflammation happens when our gut is off balance. We have a dysbiosis of the gut and all the things that wreak havoc. And a lot of the, the uh, strategies of healing for inflammation are the same as here. So it's all about this. Everything I just talked about um, is helping to heal the gut. Are there any foods that reduces pollen allergies because they're really bad during Ramadan? Yeah, so um, there is some preliminary research about 
um, like honey, like local um, organic honey, because a lot of that has the local pollen. So we can sometimes get exposed of that, you know, by having that, maybe a teaspoon of that, you know, sprinkled on something. But the allergy season um, is not that pleasant this year. I'm feeling it to myself. But usually honey and just, again, eating well in general, you know, everything that I just mentioned, you know, when we heal the gut, decreasing the inflammation, that will help us with um, the allergies. Is there any food that reduces gas? Because I experience that with everything and, and anything I eat. So that's the thing. I think you're, the gut's in transition. So when we start, again, eating some of these foods, again, I don't know what you're exactly eating. Maybe you can contact me and, and give me like a food diary so we can kind of see. But what I would suggest is, you know, whatever you're eating, times you're eating, how much you're eating, to see if there's any sort of correlation there. Um, but also when our gut's in flux, as we, so this is the thing, you guys, let's suppose you're like, this is great. I'm gung ho. I'm going to, you know, be more plant based. I'm going to do all these things that she said. And then now you get bloating and gas. That's because our gut takes time to get used to this um, lifestyle change. So um, when our microbiome, when the microbiota kind of go into overdrive, as a result, they produce gas. Um, so I would have to kind of see a little bit more in depth. Um, what you're eating and what's going on before I can give more of a definitive answer there. Where can I get a food sensitivity test? Um, that's a good question. Um, yeah, look for like a local uh, functional um, practitioner in your area. So you can, there's actually, you can just go online, functional medicine practitioner. You can do a search. So usually these are like NDs, naturopathic doctors um, that can do a food sensitivity test. Um, so you can kind of see. Um, um, whether they can do it or not. Because it's not really a common test that a lot of you know, allopathic practitioners do. It's more in the functional realm. So just look up you know, functional uh, medicine doctors or practitioners near me. And I'm sure I know in your area there must be a lot. Should it be taken before meal? I'm sorry, I, I missed what should be taken. Um, I'm sorry, I missed the first part of the question. Should it be taken before meals? Um, probiotic, I don't know. If you're gonna take a probiotic, um, it should be taken with the meal or after you had the meal. Um, but again, my recommendation, you guys, right now is just really try to get your probiotics through the food unless you are suffering from some sort of illness. Then, okay, you can get those, you know, um, supplements. So, okay. Any other questions? I think my voice has had it, guys. <laughs> All right, Murphy, that there. was that was amazing. Thank you so much. I've been waiting re a really, really long time, and I think some <laughs> of your close friends that are on today have also been waiting a really long time for these sessions. I'm so glad you were, you were able to um, start part one today, and inshallah, continue with part two uh, in the coming weeks. It was uh, truly amazing just to see you in your element. Um, all of this stuff is not just beneficial for our physical health, but I think overall our mental well-being, our emotional well-being, and that plays into our spiritual being. Um, and all of this has to do with what we, the, the services that we provide um, as part of Rahma Foundation. You know, this holistic, this idea of giving um, women a holistic, um, holistic ways or holistic programming to improve their lives and improve their health um, in all their facets. So thank you so much on behalf of the Rahma Foundation, um, on, on, on behalf of all the women in the community, and you're getting all these like um, Jazakallah khairs and, and thank yous in, in the chat box now. Uh, thank you, yeah. sisters, for tuning in. This session was recorded, and we are going to share the recording, inshallah, for the, those of your friends who may have missed part of it or all of it. Um, any last words or thoughts, Ruhi? No, I mean, I just looking at all my, hello, everyone I'm in the online world. Um, <laughs> You know, again, I know this is a lot to take in you guys. And I really, this is actually, I was trying to keep it very basic. We can delve so much more into this area. There's just so much to talk about. You know, I totally geek out about this because I love it. And, you know, and if I like, and you put it so well, you know, this, all this affects our spiritual well-being as well. Um, and our spiritual well-being affects our gut as well. So it's like, you know, an interrelationship. And I didn't really, you know, delve deep into things like that. But inshallah, we will do in the next session because inflammation is a big problem. And that's going to be the next subject. And again, if our gut's off, if we have this dysbiosis of the gut, it's going to increase inflammation levels. And if we have high inflammation levels, it affects our gut. So it's a really two-part um, street here. Um, and, you know, one last thing. And people always tell me, I, I just want to do a detox. I'm just going to drink juice and just do a detox. You know, honestly, you guys, the best detox is what we talked about here. 
increase your fruits and vegetables, get those whole grains in. And again, next session, um, we'll break it down even further on foods that I would recommend on a regular basis, you know, how we want our plates to look like. Um, so we're going to delve in deep about those things. And, you know, um, I'm okay with sharing my um, email. Um, so maybe we can post that up someplace. If you want to message me, you know, feel free. I'd love to talk to you guys. Um, but I always want you guys to do your homework first. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, research, you are a scientist observing yourself. You know, what are your triggers? What's, you know, what are certain foods that you're eating? How are you feeling after? Then we can really dig deep and kind of see what's going on to make some of those um, alterations. And if you have any questions and things that you want included in the next um, session, please email us and inshallah, I'll do my best to incorporate that. So JazakAllah khair, everyone. And please keep um, Rahma Foundation, myself, my family, friends in your du'as this blessed month. And um, inshallah, we'll see each other in the next session. Thank, thank you again, Ruhi. Um, sisters, please make sure that you're on um, our mailing list. Um, keep connected to us through uh, social media as well, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, if you haven't joined our Instagram, we just recently uh, started an Instagram account um, that we post to daily. Um, but the best way to get these recordings is by adding yourself onto the mailing list. Um, we've also updated our website recently, so you can go on the website, add yourself to the mailing list in the, the bottom section of the page. Um, and there are also some other talks there that you can uh, listen to. So much happening. Uh, one of the blessings of this uh, shelter in place is that we've been able to get out a lot more content and a lot more uh, beneficial programming uh, to the sisters in the community. So again, uh, we appreciate your feedback. We appreciate your support. Um, on that website, there's also a donate page. So we appreciate your donations this month to help us with our programming and expand our services. And with that, I'll say salamu alaikum and jazakum al for tuning in. Alaikum everyone, jazakum al